What is going on, everybody? It is Jamie Shaw here again with another episode of the Absolute Basketball Experience. On today's episode, we talk to North Carolina Central head coach Lavelle Moten. We get to dive into his philanthropic work. We get to talk into what he's built at North Carolina Central and the culture that he's going for there. Great talk, great listen, um, and uh, very excited for you guys to hear it too. Before we get into it, I ask that you please go ahead and subscribe to the channel and go ahead and give this video a thumbs up like for it and in your mentions below um i want to hear from you who you had winning this year's ncaa tournament would it be had just go, go ahead and throw it in the comments the team that you had winning the ncaa tournament this year had had it happen if you enjoyed this interview please be uh sure to share it across your platforms as well we want everybody to hear what lavelle has to say um great stuff great words uh but without further ado here is lavelle moton on the Absolute Basketball Experience with Jamie Shaw. Thank you guys very much. What is going on, everybody? It is Jamie Shaw here on the Absolute Basketball Experience. I am here with North Carolina Central head coach Lavelle Moten today. Lavelle, how's it going? I'm good, James. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, first questions first, I got to ask, what are your thoughts on the first two episodes of the Jordan documentary? Man, you know it's uh, it's, it's interesting to say the least. I think it has a, another element of uh, surprise to it, man, because we're all going through this quarantine and, you know, we kind of miss sports, basketball in particular. So the timing, as usual, for Michael Jordan is, is extraordinary, man. But it's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that we've heard about, but we never really knew about. And mm -hmm. I expect, expect that the ratings go, to go through the roof because anytime there's a Michael Jordan documentary, and he's starring in it and giving his quote and his version of it. I think mm -hmm. it always go through the roof because uh, he was the most popular person on the planet and you knew nothing about him. The only thing you knew about Michael Jordan is what he wanted you to know, right? No doubt. Incredible job of controlling his image and the narrative at all times. So now it's kind of like he's getting his gloves off and peeling the curtains back into a world where we can all see, man. And I think it's incredible. I tell you what was impressive. It kind of it reconjured up uh, memories and thoughts of him when, when he played and stuff. Is not necessarily the skill and ability and stuff, which was awesome, awesome player, all that stuff. But it's how he made you feel when you were watching him. It was almost right. like you you never seen anything like that before. Somebody so, you know, fluid and stylish and athletic and explosive yeah. and a killer man. It's yeah. like he just made you feel different than everybody else that I've ever seen play. Yeah, before him. He, he was definitely a, a novelty and, and the, probably the first novelty of this generation that we can all remember. He was, the, before him, there were guys that were athletic and before him, there were guys that were skilled. But he was the guy that put the athleticism and the fundamental skills into one. And it was a beautiful thing to watch, man. So that's what you're seeing. He was the first and, and he was the template. He was the blueprint and everyone just, uh, kind of fed off him absolutely um and, and you as a player you know as you went through your college career you amassed over 1700 career points uh third all time in, in uh, nc central history while you were in college you got the nickname poetry and moton how mm -hmm. did that come about man it was uh you know i was having a couple of good games and, and you know back then you got a lot of handwritten letters from people and a lady um wrote me a letter and she said, look, you're one of the best basketball players I've ever seen. You're just so fluid on the court. It's almost like poetry in motion, but without the I. So we'll just call you poetry in motion. And I was like, hey, that, that kind of stuck. So I took it to my SID, Kyle Serb, and you know, everybody just took it and ran with it and promoted it and marketed it. So I can't take credit. There was a, 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 a young lady who was just a fan and, and just wrote me a handwritten note. That's cool. Uh when describing your success coming from the hardships that you came from, uh, you stated on your YouTube uh, video, uh, Letter to Self, don't tell me about the odds, tell me about God's favor. Myself, right. I'm a firm believer in, uh, you know, God chooses his toughest battles for his strongest soldiers. Man. How has God shown that favor in your life to this point? Man, it's, you know, my story is an interesting one, man, and I get an opportunity to discuss it, and I always have to pinch myself because, all of the decisions that I tried to make and when I thought I knew best and, you know, tried to execute the plan that I scripted, it was a total disaster, right? The beauty about my life is some of the best times of my life was the worst times of my life. And, you know, I was thankful that he gave me a vision 
beyond my present set of circumstances because a lot of people couldn't see past that four block radius, you know, and then not only that, a lot of people couldn't see the future. You know, our concern when we were kids was just, and it was crazy, whenever we walked out of our door, every decision we made was a life or death decision just to get back home. So we won't think in 15, 18 years from now and this extensive plan, we were thinking about getting home safe. And when you grow up in an environment like that, man, you have some challenges, you have some difficulties, it affects you, it, it makes you insecure. Um, but, you know, you, you come out of it. And when you come out of it, you know, it was only, I know it was only by the grace of God. And um, I probably wasn't the most talented person out of my community uh, or my neighborhood. I probably wasn't the most, uh, the biggest, strongest or fastest person out of my community, but somehow he made way. He allowed me to be a, a, a really good basketball player. And even with this coaching business, that was his plan. It definitely wasn't mine. Um, you know, when I stopped playing basketball professionally, I was offered a job as a middle school coach um, to make $225 a month. And the same, same week, I was offered a job by my former head coach, who was at Delaware State, Greg Jackson, to make $85,000 a year. And I chose the $225 a month job. And it was only for three months. So that was $675 a year over a $85,000 job. Mm -hmm. People ask me, why did you do that? And how did you have the wherewithal to, to make that decision? And I didn't. It was just my gut. And I, I think, you know, listening to your gut is like listening to God's whispers for me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I've always trusted my gut. And the times that I went against my gut, I got myself in some big trouble out here, whether it was my mom or, you know, anybody else. So I just, I just trusted that man. And, you know, that was the inception of my coaching career and he's guided me ever since. Uh, following your playing career at Central, you mentioned you played professionally, uh, you Indonesia, India, uh, on the court, you averaged 20 per game, but what was that experience like for you off the court and how did you grow during that time? During my college years? No, during your pro years. Oh man, it was, you know, it was difficult because um, I was HBCU player of the year over a guy by the name of Ben Wallace. Right? So <laughs> he, he went on to make 90 million and, and I started going to go overseas. But, you know, the thing about it, we came out together and we were going to these all-star camps and things like that together. And we were just trying to make a name for ourselves because we knew we were both talented. We knew um, that we could compete on that level. And he went his way. I think he went to the uh, the Bullets at the time. And they were, they were Wizards now, but they were the Bullets at the time. And I went to the Supersonics at the time, who's now the OKC Thunder. And I really thought I was going to make that team. And I was one of the last ones to, to, to not make it. And it really, it was the first time in my life I had ever been cut. So from there, I went overseas. I went to uh, Indonesia. And... Um, you know, they wanted me to hang around in what was the CBA, which is the equivalent of the, the D League, and possibly get a call up. And I said, nah, man, like, I got to get my mom out the projects. That was my ultimate promise, and you know, I decided to go for seeds, man. So off the floor, it was really difficult because Indonesia was my first stop, and, you know, they were – the flight was 27 hours. Um, you know, whenever you guys would sleep, I was up, and whenever I would sleep, you guys were up. So – it, there was no equilibrium of time, uh, so it was difficult. Then there was no means of communication. The phone bill was really expensive back then, and so you just had to write letters. And, you know, I was kind of homesick a little bit, but I, I gutted it out, man, and, and, you know, made the best of the situation. And, and you know what? It really taught me how to be a man because it was the first time, you know, away from my mom's house um, on my own outside of college. So I had to really grow up and handle my responsibilities. Yeah. So you started your career as a middle school coach, as you mentioned, two hundred twenty-five dollars, and uh, the head coach, uh, two thousand one, and then in two thousand nine, you were named the seventeenth head coach in North Carolina Central history. Uh, the school where your jerseys in the rafters, your names all over the record books. Looking back, the eleven years later, how special is this place, North Carolina Central? How special is that place to you? Man, it was extremely special because, you know, again. Um, you know, your, one of your previous questions was God, how has God like altered and navigated your life? And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people don't know this story. When I came out of high school, um, I led the state in scoring my senior year. And um, I think it was like 28, 29 a game. And, you know, we were in some good company. And then my AAU team was one of the top AAU. We were the number one AAU team in the nation. Myself, Jeff Capel, Jerry Stackhouse, Chuck Cornick, like we were, 
we were loaded, you know what I'm saying? And so um, I started getting a lot of attention and a lot of buzz. And uh, one of my last schools was uh, Wake Forest and NC State. And NC State was going to end up going on probation. So I was like, I'm not going there. My cousin was at North Carolina, Donald Williams. He was a year before me. And uh, I just didn't have anywhere to go in the, in the, what was it, like the late May, early June. And so Greg Jackson, the coach at Central, came to my house and he said, um, you know, I never recruited because I never recruited you because I never thought I had the chance to get you. But if you want to come to North Carolina Central, we'll be more than happy to have you. So I signed a scholarship to attend North Carolina Central sight unseen as a player. You're right. It was the work. I never visited, never nothing, like just sight unseen because my mom just looked at me. She said, I just want you out of these projects. So that decision, even though it was sight unseen, there was a certain amount of faith that you had to have to be able to sign that paperwork. And I say, I tell that story because it's the best decision I ever made in my life because I would have never got the Carolina Central job if I was a respected player. And so it meant the world to me, even as I reflect on it now, it, mean, it meant the world. Even during the selection process throughout the committee, you know, there were so many people that was interested in getting the job. And um, I was the assistant coach. It was one of the most miserable years of my basketball life because we were going through the uh, Division Two, the Division One transformation and transition. And we just didn't have the talent. We weren't good enough. It, like it was a mess, and I was miserable. I never lost that much in my life. And so throughout the interview process, I just told them, "If you hire me in five years, we'll win a championship and we'll be the ACC school." And it was kind of like I was on my Cassius Clay for a minute, my Muhammad <laughs> Ali. But that's all I could be on because I didn't have a resume to prove um, that I was a worthy candidate in terms of coaching that particular team. I had no experience of running a Fortune 500 company like they wanted or whatever. But I told them I'll run my program the same way my grandmother ran her house and the same way my mother ran her house. And she was able to get two kids out of the projects in 40 years and uh, get them into college. So I think, you know, those core beliefs and those, that value system works. So I'll, I'll implement that here and the rest is history. You mentioned that you came on right as the transition from D2 to D1. How important do you think it was to the North Carolina Central community that it was you who kind of led that from the D1 to the D2 and into the success, you know, into the NEAC conference and all that kind of stuff? How important do you think it was to the community that it was you that did that? Man, you know what? Like, now it seems like it was a popular uh, opinion and, and the easy thing to do. But at the time, honestly, Jamie, it wasn't. Um, I was hired on March 25th, 2009. I was almost, I was, I was almost fired on March 26th, 2009 because um, my athletic director called me um, my first day on the job, on the 26th, the day after the press conference. And she said, I want you to go to lunch with somebody. And I was like, who? And she said, um, I forgot the guy's name, but she said, um, I want you to go to lunch with him because um, he's one of our boosters and alums and, he didn't feel like you were worthy of the job. So I want you to go to lunch and prove to him that, you know, you're a great guy and you're worthy of it. And I told her, I'm not doing it. And, you know, I, and she was like, huh? Excuse me. And I was like, I caught myself in what I said. And I was like, I'm not doing it. Like, I'm not going to lunch with someone that don't like me. Anybody that don't like me or don't feel like I'm deserving of this job, that's their problem. That's not mine. What other people think about me is none of my business, right? And I'm a firm believer, you know, it's, it's my background. They talked about Jesus Christ. So I know they are going to talk about me, hands down, <laughs> without a doubt. And I can't control that. So I would be going to lunch with someone different every day if I um, allowed this lunch date to happen or whatever it's going to be. So I said, I'm not going to do it. And I, I'm glad that she respected it. And, you know, the rest is history. And my, my, my point was, if I'm going to do this and, and, Y'all have hired me. I know I'm the youngest coach in the country and all of that stuff, but y'all got to believe in me and support me because there's always going to be someone calling saying he shouldn't do this or he's done that wrong or whatever it's going to be. Like you, you're always going to have the criticism and the crucifixion, right? But I just wanted the support and, you know, I was fortunate that I had that. In the 11 cents, you, you built a power, a, a program that's synonymous with success. Since joining the MEAC, you've amassed 185 total wins, 108 conference wins, four NCAA tournament appearances. What do you attribute this success to? Um, you know, it's, it's always several pieces that's much bigger than me. 
um, you know, first of all, I work at a great university with great leadership and great support. You know, um, you know, one thing you've learned from the Bulls documentary is that it starts at the top. And if there's a disconnect between the front so, office or the athletic director or the chancellor, whoever, and the coaches and the players, you know, you're not going to produce um, consistent results. So I would start there. The second thing is, um, you know, I've had really good coaches, man. I, I, I've been fortunate to hire some really passionate guys that was hard work and that was that that's bought into my vision and was able to execute what I wanted and 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 put their little spin on it um in their way and you know just really dig in deep and tie the bootstraps up and and put in multiple hours and allow us to be successful and the last thing is the kids we we've had really good basketball players right um it's not the X's and O's, it's the Jimmys and the Joes. And I've had some really, really good Jimmys and Joes, and those guys were extremely tough. And I can name them, you know, from Pooby Chapman and Jeremy Ingram to Jordan Parts to K.J. Jawar, like C.J. Wilkinson, Pat Coat, like the Jabri Blunt, the list goes on and on and on. I had some incredible guys, man, who bought into the system, believed in what I was trying to do, and they held everyone else accountable in that locker room. So... Um, and in a nutshell, I've had incredible people around me that made my job much easier and made me look a lot better than I am. Uh, you mentioned Jordan Parks. Uh, he told USA Today in an article they wrote, uh, he's a about you, he's a phenomenal coach. He has a strong bond with the university being an ex-player, being from Raleigh and doing all the things that he's done. He wants to do culture shifting things. He'd love to take NC Central and break the stigma of just being an HBCU basketball program. I, um, I wanted to kind of drive into that, dive into that quote a little bit. Can you explain on that as to what what, what he meant and what you know the culture shifting things and and creating more for in, uh, NC Central? Um, you know, I, I, I guess you know with Jordan, man, he's such an articulate guy and, and a brilliant mm -hmm. mind, and that's what that's part of what makes him great. And it's crazy you read that quote. I've never heard that and never seen that article. But um, you know, one thing I've always tried to emphasize, even through the recruiting process. You know, we try to recruit kids that that's a level above. I think that's how you win. I don't think that's a secret. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we try to sell them on the fact that, you know, you can be a big fish in a small pond or you can be a small fish in a big pond. If I would have went to Michigan State out of high school, you know, it would, it would always be Magic Johnson School. If I would have went to uh, Wake Forest, that would always be Randolph Childress and Tim Duncan School. And if I went to NC State, that would always be David Thompson School. But I tried to shift the culture and go to North Carolina Central. And the first day that I arrived, I said, look, I want to make sure before I leave here, and I, I made it a point at my middle school, my high school, in college, every place that I play, I wanted my jersey retired, right? I just think if you had that, then your body of work speaks for itself. And so as, as I ventured into the coaching ground, it's the same attitude. You know, I just wanted to achieve greatness. And you know, a lot of things um, doesn't seem achievable. Like when you're expressing your dreams to other people, you know, you often get laughed at and, and that's fine. Um, but I think what he meant by the culture shift is that I want to make history. I want to trailblaze. I want people to look back in the history books and say, no HBCU has ever done this until North Carolina Central did this. And we're on our way. And I, I, I honestly felt like in 2014, we were going to be the first HBCU in the Sweet 16. And, you know, we had an incredible year. We beat NC State's tournament team that year. We had some more great wins. I think it was ODU. And, you know, we lost to Cincinnati by five, lost to Wichita State. And I think that was their final four team by like six or something. So we, we felt like we could compete with anyone in the country. And I was, it was two weeks before the selection show, and I'm laying in my bed watching ESPN. And I said, man, if we have an opportunity to go to this tournament, it's only two teams I don't want to play. And those two teams are Louisville and Iowa State because we just didn't match up well with them. And so fast forward after we won the NCAA tournament, the Johns come out and we're matched up against Iowa State. And they had DeAndre Kane. He was like 25 years old, 6'5", <laughs> 220 point guards. Like, oh, my kid. So it was tough. And it was like – I think it was a three-point game at the half, and then they kind of wore us down in the second half. But we felt like if we would have won that game, and Jordan Parks was on that team, mm -hmm. that that would have shifted the culture um, of HBCU and, and the perception uh, in its entirety. So we're still working on that, man.
Um, so Brian Berg was just named the head coach at Georgia Southern. Uh, earlier this week, you posted on Twitter a graphic of your coaching tree. Uh, it had 13 picture name of 13 coaches who are rising up in the coaching ranks in their own rights. Some of them even running their own programs like Berg. Um, how important is that to you to mold these people into doing great things with their continue to do great things once they leave? Man, it's, you know, that's my goal. Like my, my thing is, I just think my purpose of life is to lead people and make them um, see things in themselves that they didn't possibly see and, and, and allow them to become the best version of themselves. And, and not only with kids, not only with my children, not only with my friends, but just with my coaches as well. I've seen, and Jamie, you know, like this business, it's a great game, but it's a horrible business. And there's a lot of shark infested waters and for it to be shark infested water, there's a lot of sharks out there. And I'm not really cut from the cloth of, you know, screwing people over and just, you know, there's coaches that I've seen use assistant coaches just for their greater good and to create generational wealth for their own families and never help the coaches achieve their dreams. And so I didn't want to be known as that guy because I just feel like if you pour into people, then that's how you ultimately receive, uh, that's how your blessing is reciprocated. So I always tell my, my coaches um, when I hire them, I only want you with me at th for three years. After that, you have to go because um, and I ain't firing them or kicking them out, but, you know, I want you to go out there and test the waters yourself and take care of your family and have an opportunity to double your salary and run your own programs and so on and so forth. So that graphic that you're speaking of, it was a graphic that my operations person made. And I was like, wow, you know, during this quarantine, we had a little more time than usual uh, to create some teams. And when I looked at it, I was like, wow, we left out maybe four or five people. Um, for the sake of space, but it's always great to see these guys um, move on and uh, take some of the things that uh, they learned under your program and, and make it applicable to the programs that they actively involved in. And then furthering that notion a little bit, you've said that your grandmother used to tell you that the most, the two most important days in a man's life are the day he's born and then the day he figures out why he was born. That's a long range for a man to figure out the why, why he's born, all that kind of stuff. Have you been able to figure out your why yet? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so I've been at peace with myself. And I just think, I think that's the head start and that, that, that advantage I have on most people because I, I see so many people and they're just living, they're just existing. They're not living life. They're just, they're just existing. They don't know their purpose. And I've always chased my purpose. And I just felt like my purpose in life was, and my grandmother told me this, um, I won a Pepsi hot shot when I was 10 years old and I promised her I was going to buy a, a house and, you know, a car and all of those things. And she ain't care about none of that stuff. She looked at me, she said, baby, that's fine. She said, but do understand that, you know, when you leave this earth, uh, the day that you leave this earth, if people remember you as a basketball player, then you've done a poor job of living, you know? So my job is to basically, in my purpose on earth, until God tells me otherwise, is to use basketball as a metaphor to teach life lessons to those around me. You follow mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so yes. that's what I that's what I try to do, and that's how I try to live my life every single day. And researching the interview, also a beautiful story from 2011, uh, with you taking dance, uh, taking part in the dance like no one is watching ball, uh, taking a young woman Leah Wells to the dance and everything. How did all that come about? Man, you know, it was interesting. This was like on the tail end of reading the newspaper, right? I know nobody really touches that anymore, but I was reading the newspaper uh, physically and I saw like an event. It said, dance like no one's watching. And it was a, a, a prom for people who suffered from disabilities who didn't have the opportunity to, you know, uh, attend their proms and dance. So a beautiful young lady, God rest her soul, by the name of Naomi, she was like the sponsor of it. And so she said, any volunteers that's interested, please call this number. And I never attended my high school prom. So I, you know, I felt like I missed out on some stuff too. So um, I said, look, I, I ended up calling the number and I said, Naomi, um, I don't want to volunteer. Um, if you don't mind, I, I would like to have a date. Do you have a date for me? 
And I said, I even got it approved through my wife. So I, she said, okay, perfect. And she said, I have the perfect young lady for you. And she'll probably be the dance queen this year. Her name is Leah Ward. And she told me about some of Leah's, uh, you know, physical challenges. And I said, well, tell me some more about it. Because, you know, when I go pick her up on my date, I want it to feel prom, prom like I want it. You know, I'm going all in in this. And she said, well, she loves pink. She loves Pink Floyd, her favorite color pink. Like, it was all pink, pink, pink. And then she liked Duke basketball and, you know, things of that nature. So I got Coach K to sign a basketball. I rented a stretch limo and got her, like, it was a pink limousine, right? I don't know how they had this stuff. <laughs> but we had a pink limousine, man, and I went and picked up. And, you know, we went to the dance, and um, we had a great time. We ate, we, we danced, we laughed, we joked. Um, she forgot about life's problems. I forgot about life's problems. Um, and it was almost like, you know, something that was destined. And it was the start of a lifelong friendship. So I told her, um, you can't just take me to the prom and dump me. Like, we have to talk at least once a week, man. So she's an incredible uh, young lady. She's an incredible spirit, man. And we talk all the time. Uh, and I'm thankful and grateful for her friendship. Yeah, that, that, that was such an awesome story. Um, you know, and moving on kind of toward the, those lines, your charity, Bell Cares, you do a lot of stuff, book bag drives and all that kind of stuff. I, I kind of want to ask you about one, uh, the single mother's uh, salute. I think that's an awesome uh, a thing. Uh, you know, you invite 100 single moms from around the triangle, celebrate them for an evening. You give awards out such as, uh, uh, you know, the mother of the year, the mother of sacrifice, the mother of fortitude awards and all that kind of stuff. What does this night mean to you? It means everything, man, because I was the product of a single mom and I know the difficulties and I know the challenges and, you know, it's crazy. My goal in life, and I'm thankful that it was my goal because it was clear cut and simplistic. It wasn't any complexities involved in it. It was just clear. My goal in life was just to make sure my mom never had to work again and retire my mom. That was it, you know, and however I, I had to do that, I was going to make sure I did that because I saw the struggle and the daily challenge on her face and no one ever worked no one in the history of this world has ever worked harder than my mother i'm a firm believer of that and so i just wanted her to have an opportunity to have her roses so you know uh, i created a single mother salute and i said i'm going to honor 150 moms in the triangle um i connected with a you know, some incredible sponsors throughout the event because we're now going into our seventh year and we give over $30,000 worth of prizes, right? And it's, you know, first come, first serve. They submit essays and my mom read every essay. It's 12 o'clock. My mom selects um, all of the winners and it's like eight, eight, nine winners. And, um, you know, it's from fortitude, from strength to love, to courage, to sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera. And then each award is named after my mom so it's a way for me to pay tribute to my mom and show uh gratitude and appreciation for everything that she's done for me and it's just a it's a great fun man it's a red carpet event um you know incredible guest speakers incredible food um plenty of pitches over thirty thousand dollars worth of prizes um flat screen tvs vacations um like you the trips you name it like these these women have the time of their life man and i just sit back and you know is is real heart heart it pulls your heartstrings when you see it oh no question and and you know going back you mentioned earlier about the, the, the 2014 team and 2013 14 on the heels of 15 and one miac record wins over nc state wins over app state during that year you became a 14 seed in the NCAA tournament, not a play-in game, a 14 seed. How important of an accomplishment is that? Man, that's, yeah, that's, that shows that it can be done. You know, that sends um, not only hope, I don't like the word hope because hope means you haven't achieved anything, you know, in terms of uh, physically being able to say, I did this. Um, but it shows that it can be done. So it, it shows that, you know, with hard work, determination and dedication and the right staff and the right team, um, you can make history and you can move the needle forward and you can eliminate the perception and the dark cloud that hang over HBCU's heads from time to time. We just consider ourselves a, a mid-major and our goal is to be the best program in the country. So whoever and wherever we're competing against any particular school, you know, we, we expect to, to get out on the dance floor the same way, man. So it was something that we'll cherish forever. I think it was the most wins by HBCU in a single season. 
Um, you know, that was extremely difficult. We had 15 conference wins, but when you have 15 conference wins, that means you have 13 out of conference wins, you know? So um, it was gratifying to say the least um, and something that I'll cherish for the rest of my life. Once a load of mid-major programs find success, it becomes harder and harder to schedule out of conference games. Yeah. You won the MEAC regular season conference title, uh, regular season title or conference title or both six of the last seven years. This season, uh, you play. You had one D1 home game yeah. uh, with nine of them on the road. You went to Akron, to Louisville, to Louisiana State, to Southern Illinois, to Youngstown State. None of these games are local. None of these games are close. Right. Why do you think it is? Uh, to be honest, fear, scared. You know, like it's 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 almost like a heavyweight fighter not wanting to fight a contender that could possibly knock him out. You know, and he's kind of waiting for that payday and extravaganza and so on and so forth. And we understand, it. like, it, it's, it's been so difficult for us now that we understand that. Um, I'm sorry about that. It's been so difficult for us now that we understand that we're not getting any home games. We're not getting, um, no one is coming to North Carolina Central because no, no one wants that burden, right? It's, it's, it's not an easy win. Um, even in guaranteed games, it's, it's teams that aren't willing to play players. So I guess to answer in a nutshell, we've been a victim of our own success, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the accomplishments and the accolades that come along with it, you know, the flip side is just the curse of it is the scheduling and no one wants to play you. So you got to kind of compromise some things. And sometimes there's no rhyme or reason in why you're scheduling. You're just trying to finish the complete game. And, you know, that's what we're going through. And we see it as a sign of, respect we know that we're revered we even had we we've even called athletic directors and i you know I, I won't call out anyone but in the state of north carolina because it's 20 21 state schools in north carolina so we shouldn't really have to leave north carolina and the response has been hell no we're not playing you right that's the exact message from you know some of the athletic directors hell no we're not playing you so we get it we understand it and and you know it's just a sign of respect and we take it as such Wrapping up with two quick questions here. Uh, some college coaches say it's not about recruiting the best players. It's recruiting the right players. I feel you've done an excellent job in looking at what you do as a coach and having a clear vision and finding the players who fit your mold as to what it is that you're looking to do. What would you say um, is that fit? What boxes do, do these players check off that fit your mold? Um, obviously, they have to they have it, but – I think the one, the, the main box is the, the toughness. Like that's something that we really look at, that we really evaluate. And when I'm assessing these young men in the summers, um, you know, the one thing I want to know is how tough is he? How does he respond when things do not go his way? Because I don't care how great you are in high school. I don't care how great you are in your junior colleges or prep schools. I don't care how great you were at other universities. There's going to be adversity that you must face. Um, doing a 40 minute game right on, on this level night in and night out regardless of who you are and who you are ultimately depends on how you respond uh, to that adversity are you going to soak and pout when things don't go your way because a lot of high school kids they may need they may average 20 points but they it, it takes them 20 shots to get 20 points on this level you're not going to get that many so how can you um utilize your value and if you're not making shots, can you still help us win basketball games on the other end? So those are the things, you know, that, that we look for, how tough a kid is, because ultimately in our season comes down to three days in March, regardless of our body of work. Mm -hmm. And the team, the team that we're battling against nine times out of ten, they know what we're doing, we know what they're doing. But who's going to be the toughest guy to execute that, <laughs> right? And so that's what it boils down to. So that's what we pretty much look for and assess whenever we're recruiting. And then lastly, you spent this summer coach with the U19 team for the USA, won a gold medal. Um, what was this experience like for you? And what did you take away from that to bring back to NC Central? Man, it was, it was incredible. The first year I did it was 2015. And uh, that was the team with Harry Giles, Jason Tatum, uh, Brunson, Terrence Ferguson, uh, Caleb. Caleb. Biggie, Biggie that was from Biggie. Purdue, he got drafted by Monaghan. Portland Trailblazers. It's like, man, we had so much talent on that team. And, um, you know, so I did it last year. And last year, 
That was incredible. But it was I was the first HBCU coach ever. And so I had went in with a chip on my shoulder. So mm-hmm. I coached these kids the same way I coached my North Carolina Central team. And I was like, I was demanding. I was like, look, we have to win this. And they're like, well, I was coach. So I was like, we have to win it because if we don't win it, I don't want personally, I don't want them to say we could, we didn't win it because we allowed him to help coach this team. You know, yeah. so it was a chip on my shoulder. So we pushed them every day from the start of trials. And Reggie Perry from Mississippi State, uh, he ended up being MVP. But Tyrese Halliburton was incredible, man. You know, he'll be a top five lottery pick. It was top six. And Cade Cunningham was incredible. And, and Jalen Green, like we had some talent, man. And, yeah. you know, these guys really tested the game plan and um, you know, the, uh, Coach Weber was incredible with how he dealt with the kids. He gave us all specific uh, uh, duties and, and responsibilities, uh, and he trusted us to coach. And, um, you know, it was a great thing, man. And we were able to go out there and win a gold medal. And, and just to hear the national anthem playing with a gold medal around your neck, that, that hits a little differently. You know, so that's, that's, that's a lot different. And it's something, you know, where I'm from, people don't get a chance to. Uh, earned gold medal. So I'm extremely proud and fortunate I had the opportunity to do that. Oh, that's awesome. Lavelle, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for coming on and spending a little bit of time with me and talking and stuff. You're an impressive person and uh, it really means a lot that you came. Jamie, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for considering me and think about me. And if anything I can do for you, let me know. Absolutely. Guys, thank y'all very much for tuning in. For Lavelle Moten, I'm Jamie Shaw on the Absolute Basketball Experience. Thank you. And there you have it with Lavelle Moten on the Absolute Basketball Experience with Jamie Shaw. Great talk. We were able to peel back the layers of, uh, of his vision of what he's done uh, with the program, where he's got the program going, and also what he's done off the court as well, which is equally impressive, not more impressive than, than his incredible accolades on the court. Um, if you haven't done so already, please be sure to go ahead and subscribe to the channel and go ahead and give it a th- this video a thumbs up, a like. And if you enjoyed the interview, be sure to share it across your platforms as well to let everybody see and hear what Lavelle has to say. Um, We very much appreciate that. But we thank you guys very much for tuning in. And until next time, I am Jamie Shaw on the Absolute Basketball Experience.